Another list of 10 games from the almighty Commodore 64 starts off with a game I actually have three original copies of in my collection for some strange reason, although the first time I had it was in a compilation called Solid Gold. All of the games in the compilation are very nostalgic for me one way or another, but I have chosen Infiltrator for today's first game. Infiltrator puts you in the shoes of an ace pilot and neurosurgeon who goes by the name of Johnny McGibbets and your mission is to fly into enemy territory then sneak into their buildings and grab pictures of important documents. You start off your mission by the most difficult part of the game which is taking off your helicopter, fly towards your destination, have the occasional conversation with enemy pilots and eventually land near their area. Then you have to walk around a large area, avoiding minefields and finding enemy buildings to scavenge, and find the all important papers. You will often need to show some false identifications to suspecting enemy guards, but likely more often than that, you are required to use gas grenades or sleeping gas spray to deal with the guards. To be completely honest, I have never actually managed to pass through the flying bits in the game, so the only way for me to get to the walking around parts of the game have early on been through freeze extracted versions that I got from my friend's turbo tape compilations. Still, the sneaking spying parts of the game are even still so difficult for me that I have never managed to get out of the sections alive. But that's part of why I'm still so badly addicted to Infiltrator, and I do intend to master the flying bits as well, someday. Originally released through Mindscape in North America, Infiltrator was introduced to European gamers by the biggest important company at the time, US Gold, in 1986, and added the tagline, the game that rocked America, for higher commercial value. As was only common for American games in those days, Infiltrator doesn't exactly boast of great sounds and graphics, but rather the gameplay is very involving, even if most of it is surprisingly simple, at least on the face of it. It's definitely one of the better stealth games for the Commodore 64, and although it doesn't exactly surpass Metal Gear in quality, Infiltrator does predate it by a year. For that reason already, Infiltrator is well worth having a look at. This next game I don't actually have as an original in my collection yet, although I fully intend to find one before too long. Donald Duck's Playground, published by Sierra Online in 1984, was one of my most often revisited games from my youth, as it always made me feel happy and stress-free. Might sound a bit weird, since the game practically revolves around the idea of working several jobs in order to buy a bunch of toys for the local playground, which Donald's nephews, Huey, Dewey and Louie, will then enjoy to their best abilities. The game is structured very simply. It starts at a street, which divides the two sides of the main game into two sides of the street. On the right side we have the working places, an airport where you must throw packages into carriages going into different areas, toy store where you must restock the shelves from the toys appearing one by one on the counter, a fruit market where you must catch flying fruit that someone is throwing from the back of a pickup truck and drop it into their corresponding crates, and then there's the job as the Amquak Express Railway Junction Operator. On the left side we have three stores, which are operated by Mickey, Minnie and Goofy. All three stores contain various kinds of toys and items to make the entire playground grid structure more accessible. You do need to buy at least three ladders or other such things to get access to the top of the structure. Early on I noticed that the best way to play this game was to choose the highest difficulty level because then you would be able to earn the most money in the same amount of time. 
one play of each of the jobs for an 8 minute shift in the highest difficulty should be enough, or at least almost enough to get everything you need for the playground. There is no ending here because if you feel like changing the contents of the playground later on, it's fully editable. Personally, I always like to have one long slide that goes from the top to the bottom, and the rest of it is secondary. But again, it's a feel-good game with no pressure on anything, unless you want to get as much done and earn as much as possible in as short a time as possible, and even then, Donald Duck's Playground can be easily manageable. I can't say it works that well as edutainment as it's supposed to, but it is a charming little game and it's nice to revisit once in a while. I also wrote a comparison of it many years ago, link in the description if you want to check it out. Another link to the blog goes for this game, Kickstart 2 from Mastertronic 1987. It's a very accessible trials biking racing game and it's also another one of those games that I got very early on in my C64 gaming career as an original tape along with almost 50 other games. It quickly became one of my all-time favorites for the C64, not the least thanks to its easy-to-use track editor, which allowed you to save your designs on tape or disc. Kickstart and its sequel were named after a British Trials motorbiking TV show with the letter C dropped from its name, possibly to dodge some copyright issues, who knows. I was introduced to this format through the second game because that's what I had first. If I remember correctly, the first Kickstart game has maybe 10 tracks and a very awkward speedometer with very little instructions on how to get through all the obstacles. Your speed is much more manageable in Kickstart 2 and the obstacles and surface elements follow a better logic. There are also over 20 inbuilt tracks to race on, so the sequel is, at least for me, better than the original game in every possible way. One of the stranger things about Kickstarter 2 is that although it can be considered very much a joystick-driven game, I learned to play it on the keyboard. It's also where I learned how the port 1 joystick directions are mapped on the keyboard. To this day, I'd rather play Kickstarter 2 with control, 1, 2 and space than use a joystick. I suppose it's part of the nostalgia, but that's how it goes. Another game from the Solid Gold compilation that I would have liked to mention is Leaderboard, but as it happens, I actually played that one first on the ZX Spectrum. So instead, I'm choosing Executive Leaderboard, which was another turbo tape finding, and I definitely preferred that one over all the other Leaderboard games ever released for the C64. Now if you've never played Leaderboard, but are familiar with golf games for other 8-bits, the differences here are the 3D mapping modeling, the speed of moving from one spot to another, and the realistic wind effects. The only thing missing from the series, which the series' spiritual successor, Lynx, brought into the picture, was detailed ground surface contours. The thing is, the executive version plays pretty much exactly like its predecessor, but the courses are different here, and you get trees and sand pits as new obstacles. Still, it doesn't feel too heavy on the CPU like World Class Leaderboard does, so it's really the most optimal game from the series for the C64. Then again, Executive Leaderboard still doesn't feature real-world golf courses, which World Class Leaderboard fixed later on, but I'm not that particular about that sort of realism. In fact, I prefer the game doing its own thing so well it doesn't matter if it's modeled after real golf courses or not. Oh, and by the way, I also did a comparison of the original leaderboard some years ago, so that's another link you can find in the video description. Now here's probably an obvious choice, but Pit Stop 2, released by Epix in 1984, was the favorite racing game for many for a good reason. Quite simply, it was ahead of its time. Epix's first pit stop was already groundbreaking in that it introduced the idea of doing pit stops during races so you could change worn out tires and refill the gas tank. The driving itself in that one wasn't particularly exciting though. Pit Stop 2 made the racing part of the game more eventful and more importantly gave you a chance to play against a friend in a classic split screen mode. Graphically, Pit Stop 2 was upgraded from the original, now more closely resembling Pole Position, 
which was considered the yardstick for Formula One style racing games at the time. Sound wise there is nothing particularly interesting to say, but it is nice to hear the game sync up so well in a two player race. But it's a combination of a great two player mode and the pit stopping element that has always made Pit Stop 2 the winner that it is. If you're a C64 gamer and Pit Stop 2 is not in your nostalgia list, I'd say that would be a paradox. Another Epix game from the same year, and I'd say this one is an even more obvious choice than the last one due to its inclusion in every possible C64 rehash compilation and mini console published in the last 10 years or so. And of course I'm talking about... Another visitor. Stay a while. Stay forever. Impossible Mission. I mean, yeah, you could say that this game suffers from overexposure and it's worse than its status would make you expect, and I would agree with all that. But, Impossible Mission is probably the most quintessential C64 game there is. It was born in the land of C64's origin, the US of A. It was one of the very rare occasions when an American C64 game developer made something as good looking and good sounding as well as infernally addicting as anything ever made for the machine by Europeans. It was created by the very same Dennis Caswell, who also made Pit Stop 2. Now whether you like it or not, every single element about Impossible Mission is iconic. The elevator shafts and the noise they make, the agent's running animation, the Destroy him, my robot. and voice samples, the high-tech rumbling noises and electrocutions, the computer terminals, the large black balls, you're searching through all the furniture you can safely access, the black and white grid puzzles and even the baffling puzzles you need to work out in your palm computer and in the elevator screens. It doesn't matter that you don't necessarily know what you're doing, the exploration is enough to make the game a magical experience each time you play it. The game has the ability to make you feel good when you figure out something you didn't previously. And I'm talking about this game as someone who doesn't even particularly like it. I rarely play Impossible Mission because I played it too much as a kid, and I've realized there's too many other great games to learn about. Still, it is a necessary C64 experience. Today's obligatory Husen game is Nebulous from 1987. It's another one of those love it or hate it type games, an opinion which can mostly be attributed to your skills in the game. And Nebulous is a very difficult one, even in the beginning. But it's also a fairly rewarding game, which makes you feel like you're becoming a better overall player as you're making progress. You control a character that looks like a miniature pig on two feet, and your mission is to reach the top of each tower by going through doorways and eliminating hazards. Easier said than done, but there is a logic to all things you need to take into consideration. For example, there are certain squeaky things that come at you from the right side of the screen at the exact moment you wish they wouldn't, but there's always some method of avoiding them. And then again, sometimes you also need to use them to your advantage. Between each level there is a submarine shooting section where you need to shoot fishes and collect them afterwards for points. Because the game only has 8 levels, it increases difficulty in a fairly quick pace, so chances of ever completing the game are very low. It is however a game you can memorize if you can bother to keep up repeating it. My personal record must be somewhere around the 5th or the 6th level, I can't be sure now, but I can get to level 4 on a regular basis. I love the atmosphere in this game, and the sheer craziness of the concept is something that keeps me coming back to it every now and then. Probably more often than most other Husen games, I'd say. And it's another game you can find a comparison of at the block. Another link in the list. Okay, now if you're a fan of chess, 
but never really found it appealing to play on a computer or a video game console because the virtual environment just doesn't add anything new to the table. You might want to check out a couple of chess-like strategy games from Electronic Arts. Archon, The Light in the Dark, and its sequel, Archon 2, Adept, released in 1983 and 84 respectively. Personally, I found Adept first, and remains my favorite of the two, but let's focus on the first one first. According to an interview with Freefall associates John Freeman and Anne Westfall, the original Archon was inspired by a fantasy chess set at a sci-fi convention, a large-scale live-action chess game at a renaissance fair, and that brief scene in Star Wars showing a holographic chess-like game. Like in chess, you play light against dark, although you can freely choose which side you want to play as. Unlike in chess, both sides have different set pieces with somewhat different skills. More comparable to the Star Wars chess-like game, all the characters on the board will meet up to fight in a separate field, where they will use their given weapons to defeat the other player. Depending on the square you decide to land your attack on, the field will feature different kinds of hazards and obstacles to make your fights more interesting. As if that weren't enough, you also have a spellcaster which can use seven different spells once per game. All in all, the original Archon is an amazing game, unlike anything created before or since, and is one of my most often played two-player games on the C64 when I have a friend over to play against. Also, it needs to be said that Archon was one of Electronic Arts' first published games, and it's this period that us old-timers got to know the company as a good one. Archon was such a huge hit for Electronic Arts that instead of the intended murder on the Zinderneuf as their contractual second game, Freefall were persuaded to create a sequel for Archon instead. Adept is a bit more difficult to make sense of as it was created to expand on the original idea rather than just to reinvent the wheel. The game takes place within four circles of different elements, and instead of a clear set of chess-like pieces to move around with, your adepts need to summon monsters and elementals to move around and attack the enemies, or perform other kinds of magic. You can also use your four given adepts to attack each other, but when all else fails, you can summon Apocalypse to trigger a sudden death fight between your main adepts. Despite its graphical style and general gameplay, Adept is a vastly different experience from its predecessor, and well worth putting some time into. Another one of the first games in my collection came in a compilation called Live Ammo. It's one of the better movie tie-in games based on none other than the second movie in the Rambo franchise. Here I need to make an exception and point out the wonderfully strange loading music which incorporates a Morse code at the beginning of the track. Listen to this. Apparently the Morse code plays out the game's creator's names, which is a neat little easter egg. The game itself is an epic mixture of brilliant music sourced from the movie itself, as well as a good-looking, well-structured, quick shooting game in three acts. First you need to find your way into the Vietnamese village, destroy a bunch of stuff, then find a helicopter just north of the village. Second you need to fly back south and land in the village, then free the prisoners of war from the cage and return to the helicopter. 
Act 3 makes you fly all the way up north to your base while avoiding contact with the enemy helicopter and shooting it as much as you can. Land safely and you will start your mission all over again. Eliminating the enemy chopper fair and square is very difficult, so I'm suspecting for that reason the game developers included an inbuilt cheat to press down a couple of keys in the keyboard and simultaneously pull the joystick in a certain way to make you fly about a thousand miles per hour backwards but north. Using that method, the game can be completed in less than three minutes. Despite its obvious shortcomings, Rambo First Blood Part 2 is one of the most memorable movie tie-in games on the C64 and due to its amazingly good soundtrack, it's always nice to revisit. Again, a comparison link in the video description. Today's list ends with another Finnish game that's practically impossible to find for purchase anywhere, but it has been circulating on turbo tapes and floppy disks since it was released in 1986. The game is called Painter Boy, and it was created as an advertisement game for a Finnish paint company, Tikkurila. An unlikely topic for a game to be sure, Painter Boy's action was based on the two characters featured in the TV adverts in the mid-80s, whose names were always left undisclosed, but the boy character was being taught things about painting houses and life in general by the old master painter. The boy would constantly be distracted by a girl he was infatuated with, and she has been included in the game as an object of penalty, similarly to birds and dogs. Also, if you happen to paint the master by accident, you are given penalty for that too, which is a bit annoying since he walks around in a random manner doing nothing. Just so that game would actually put the trademark to good use, they incorporated a matching game of selecting the correct paint out of five possible ones to be used for painting the tasked building. The job would always be handed to you at the paint shop where the game starts. After selecting the paint, you would need to drive to the building to be painted by following the compass. Remember, there were no navigators back in the 80s. And after finishing the job, you need to get back to the headquarters. That's a lot for a game of this age and style, and because of the variety, Painter Boy never felt boring to play.